thank you everybody for joining us for the latest and also the last webinar in our targeted learning webinar series. Last month, we heard from John Kinkato and Hannah Lee at the FDA about FDA's interest in using real world evidence to support regulatory decision making. And so to wrap up our series, our webinar series, I've asked Mark Vandalem, the developer of targeted learning and TMLE and SuperLearner to talk about how the targeted learning frame framework can help FDA do just that. So um, he is going to present today a talk entitled Targeted Learning Towards a Future Informed by Real World Evidence. Dr. Vandalam is the Jen Ping Shu Carl E. Peace Professor in Biostatistics and Statistics at UC Berkeley. And he's received many honors for his work, including the COPS President's Award, the Mortimer Spiegelman Award, and the Van Danzig Award. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Vandalam with us today. So now, Mark, I would like to please turn it over to you. All right. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Susan, and also for this opportunity to give this uh, presentation. Uh, so yeah, the title is Targeted Learning Towards the Future Informed by Real World Evidence. Uh, this is, uh, I have to acknowledge the help from various people, in, uh, Rachel Phillips and Ivana Melanica, and, and also Susan. So in, uh, in a recent talk by John Concato, uh, August 4, uh, he showed this uh, table, which essentially gives the continuum from traditional randomized trials to maybe more pragmatic randomized trials and, and uh, single arm studies uh, augmented with external controls and then uh, you know in the end uh, the other extreme uh, observational studies um, and thereby the corresponding increasing reliance on real world data and um, yeah, and that is uh, kind of what we are dealing with. Uh, there is a continuum, really. Uh, also in observational studies, there's a continuum from a kind of perfect study with no confounding, no missingness, uh, everything clean, uh, towards issues even with randomized trials, like informative dropout. Uh, and, but then, yeah, even in observational study, you might have a lot of knowledge about how treatment was assigned, and you might have a reliable outcome and have no trouble ascertaining it, and there's, uh, and maybe the missing is as well understood as well. And so that observational study could be as powerful. Uh, and then event, and there will be also observational studies where there's little knowledge and maybe unmeasured confounder and so on and so on. So that's what we're dealing with. And how can we, along this whole continuum of studies, have a methodology which can handle all these challenges? And uh, so just to list some of these challenges, when we move towards more and more real world data, is we have to deal with uh, selection bias, uh, potentially. Uh, it's very common to have intercurrent events, like in a randomized trial, uh, people uh, start, um, for example, you, there might be events happening, uh, certain uh, changes in the disease status, or uh, certain other things uh, can happen, or just the biomarker uh, gets measured regularly, and these things then might inform uh, dropouts. And so uh, even in randomized trials with survival outcomes, this is very common to have to deal with. Now, informative missingness, of course, where the missingness maybe of the outcome is not just, uh, is, yeah, it depends, it's not random and, and might depend on characteristics of the subject. And again, you then hope that you, you measure at least these characteristics, uh, maybe not completely. Now, treatment by indication becomes more and more a problem when you move towards, um, Real world, more and more real world data uh, that you might have less and less understanding of how treatment was assigned and what variables were used. And maybe there are even some unmeasured variables. Maybe doctors were from another network and they didn't have access to all the information on the patients. So that kind of thing. Uh, high dimensional covariates is more and more common. Uh, uh, it's extremely common. I mean, we all know about uh, genomics, we know about uh, uh, natural language processing where we extract. Uh, features of text uh, to, from, for example, doctor's notes. I mean, these all become very high dimensional covariates. Uh, there might be problems with ascertaining the outcome in a completely reliable way. Uh, again, that might be understood well or not well at all, or that all these variations could happen. 
And then, of course, we have to deal with statistical model misspecification. Uh, and that itself is a serious problem. And, for example, when we start incorporating external controls, we worry about these external controls being somewhat different from the controls you would have had in an RCT, in that RCT you're looking at, at least for which you have the single arm. And, there might, and that uh, is another problem. Now, targeted learning has the flexibility uh, to deal with these challenges. And that's what this talk uh, just kind of, uh, is about and, and points out. And the key uh, is really to, uh, is the roadmap. It's, the, it's just a relatively simple uh, sequence of steps you have to go through when you get confronted with the real world problem, uh, study, data, and, and questions. You have to go through these steps. And that, uh, yeah, that's that so-called roadmap is of target of learning from data or you know, with concerns and causal effect, the roadmap for causal inference, you might call it as well. Uh, that roadmap uh, involves a number of steps. And uh, the first step is you describe the experiment which generated data. It's common sense from a statistical perspective, right? If you're a statistician, you realize that data is a random variable. It's the result of an experiment. And that the data itself, without understanding the experiment, is essentially impossible to interpret. And just different underlying experiments will have very different conclusions, uh, even when the data looks very similar. So that's the first thing. You have to understand the experiment which generated the data. And that in, in particular involves, of course, defining the data. And so, and then we move to the second step, which is about specifying what we know about the data distribution, and then the statistical query, and then, uh, yeah. and then we have to find the statistical estimation problem, and then we have to construct an estimator. We need to get inference for that estimator. That estimate needs to have a bunch of properties we desire. And in the end, we want to make substantive conclusion. So we'll pay a little attention to each of these steps, uh, and in particular through an example. So let's talk about step one. And here the example is that we have uh, three uh, multinational randomized control trials, which is actually real, uh, which were used to evaluate the impact of steroids on mortality among septic shock patients. So a question in the medical community was, should we just do the antibiotics or should we augment the antibiotics with steroids? And the, under, and the kind of medical kind of uh, sense was that the steroids could be very helpful for these patients. So they actually carried out a lot of randomized trials, uh, essentially sequentially, in, in a total of 32. And none of them could show the benefit of the steroids. And even a meta-analysis couldn't show the benefit. Um, in particular, if you focus on the three big RCTs, so which are maybe more comparable, uh, and you do a meta-analysis on that, then again, the confidence of all does include this relative risk one, and therefore it doesn't provide a significant result. And uh, so in this, uh, if we focus on these three uh, randomized trials, then we can talk about what the data is. Uh, now we have, of course, an understanding. We have three RCTs, so we understand how the data was collected, in particular, for each within each uh, trial. And then it involves collecting on each subject in history, like COVID, which in this case, you know, we have people coming in the intensive care unit. So we have some uh, standard measurements you make on these patients. They represent the uh, covariates. W, then the doctor is going to make a decision about giving steroids or not. And then after one month, we will know if the person made it or not, because this is a very serious thing and people die. And so after a month, you would know if it has been a successful outcome or not. So that describes uh, the data uh, and an understanding of the experiment. And then the next step in the roadmap is to specify what is known about the uh, stochastic relations between the observed variables. Uh, for example, in this case, we have uh, covariance W, we have an 
subsequent treatment A and a subsequent final indicator of death of Y. So you might factorize that joint density of the data as the marginal distribution of W, the conditional distribution of the treatment given the covariates, and then the conditional distribution of death given the treatment and the covariates. You can then ask the question from each of these stochastic conditional distributions, what do I know about them? And you might, and then you have to be honest. That's one of the key things here. When you define a statistical model, it's supposed to be done in a way that it only makes assumes things about the data distribution, in other words, makes restrictions on the possible set of densities of the data, which are known to be true. Now, so in this study, you would not know anything about the distribution of the covariates. You would probably also not know anything about the probit of death, how it depends on the treatment and the covariates. Uh, and then, but then there is also the treatment mechanism, and there, of course, uh, there's a lot of knowledge there, in, in this case, uh, even randomization. So that's an example of a statistical model. You did really make assumptions, but they were known to be true. And so in general, statistical models for observational studies as well, they are not going to involve parametric assumptions. They're not involving parametric models. They will mostly be conditional independence assumptions and potentially some bounds uh, on, on probabilities that you know they should always be smaller than 5%, or if that's kind of the known thing. That's, these are all important knowledge. But they are, that's the kind of restrictions we will, be, we, we, will, we will be able to assume about our data distribution. Now, here is just a picture. And statistical model is just a set of possible dis probability distributions. Uh, P0 is the true data distribution. That's the actual one in this experiment. And you want to make sure that your statistical model, which may, might, in which you make assumptions, thereby exclude possible distributions, it doesn't exclude the real guy. The P0. Now, if you assume a parametric model, you can be 100% certain the real guy is not in there. So at that moment, you have already excluded the true data distribution with all its drastic implications for anything you're going to do from then on. So this is a very key, important step. And that's really where the distinction happens between most of traditional statistics and targeted learning. It's the, the formulation of what is really known and what you really want as an in a, in a transparent, honest statistical uh, estimation problem. And so just to, uh, as a quick uh, review that if you, for example, assume a parametric regression model, uh, for example, in this particular example, where you would have assumed that the probability of death is a logistic regression in the binary treatment choice and the covariates, uh, you, would, uh, you would have to uh, you would make assumptions uh, which are not true. And, uh, and typically that means you're start picking up bias uh, because you didn't really adjust for all the confounders because you only put them in as main terms and thereby uh, you are starting to see a coefficient in front of the treatment even when maybe in reality it, there is no effect uh, at all. So this is particularly problematic of course in observational studies where uh, where that's for sure going to happen because there are uh, truly variables which were used to make the treatment decision. And by just putting these variables, even though you measure them in there as main terms, you are not adjusting for them properly. You could have put them in as squares. You could have used any kind of basis functions, uh, as transformations of these covers. You could have included interactions with treatment. All these things you wouldn't do, meaning you leave them out. And if you leave them out, that's like an unmeasured confounder. So in essence, you are acting as if you have unmeasured confounding and you pay the price for that. So you would pick up a signal which doesn't exist if there is no signal. And of course, you're confident of all, whatever the signal is true, or real or not, uh, will with probability tending to one, start excluding uh, the true quantity of interest. So this is the picture you see here, the type one error rate, so if the null is true, you will have a larger sample size, you will start with probably tending to one, start selecting, uh, re rejecting the null. And similar with the common interval, it will get narrower and narrower, but it gets narrower and narrower around this uh, wrong guy, the biased one. So once we have defined the statistical model in an uh, honest and transparent way, 
then the next question becomes, what is the query? What, do, what are we trying to learn? And so typically that goes in two steps, is that you first say, let me first try to understand in a hypothetical world, you know, maybe where I are able to observe perfect data, like we, you know, we might assume one of the causal models, such as the Neyman Rubin causal model, where you assume that for every subject there, is, let's say in this case, two counterfactual outcomes, one under treatment, one under control. And you say, hey, if I would observe that, then I know what I want. For example, you might say, then I care about the average treatment effect. I want to know what is the mean of all the potential outcomes under treatment among my population. Mine is the mean among the potential outcomes under control. And that is my quantity I care about. Okay, so that's where you see the utility of causal models, structure equation models, like real structure equation models or name and Rubin model. Both are fine and they can be used and they allow us you to define these causal quantities essentially as features of the probability distribution of the potential outcomes under certain interventions. So that's nice, but then you also have to deal with the reality and that's the second step. And this, the reality is that you didn't observe both Y0 and Y1. For every subject, you observe only one of them and you know which one. So you have a missing data problem really, missing outcome problem. There were two outcomes, you only get to see one. And that means you need some assumption on the missingness. And that's in the causal uh, setting, we often refer to that as the randomization assumption that you want that given the confounders, given each strata of the confounders, that the treatment was like a flip of a coin. And, um, and thereby, you could say the treatment was not based on unmeasured factors, which were also predictive of the outcome. And so, uh, if you make that assumption and also an, yeah, an, an so-called positivity assumption or experimental treatment assignment assumption, uh, which says, look, uh, if within a straight of the confounders, you see that everybody receives treatments, then you have a problem because that means within that straight of the confounders, you cannot identify the causal effect. And therefore, you, your, your identification really starts breaking down. Uh, so that's another assumption you need. But with these two fundamental assumptions, the, no unmeasured confounder assumption and the randomization assumption, you would be able to establish that this average treatment effect equals this particular feature of the probability distribution of the data. We often call the target estimate. And here is the target estimate. It would be you compute the probability of death for every strain of the covariance. You compute the probability of death under treatment and under control. You take the difference and you take the average of these conditional probabilities. Uh, of death given the covariance W. And so that is now the estimate is actually now something we can learn from the data. This is not about the underlying counterfactuals. This is about the observed outcome. And so that's a beautiful thing, uh, but there were assumptions and you have to then think carefully. We'll get to that, but uh, understand to what degree that assumption might be holding or not. And it might motivate you to be honest, you say, look, this was an electronic uh, health record study, but I feel very uncomfortable that uh, these doctor's notes were not utilized and, and they are capturing some of the real confounders. And so I don't feel comfortable to start using this as my target estimate. I think it might be too far away. I want to first invest in getting better data and maybe use things like natural language processing to capture these doctor's notes so to get higher quality a study. Now that's fine. That's great, right? That's again where you see the benefit of understanding causal inference and the identification results and the corresponding assumptions, so that you can respond to that and have an understanding of what it takes to have a high quality study. Uh, but either way, um, you could still think of this as this is for this particular study the best I'm going to do. It adjusts for all the measured confounders. It's trying to get as close as possible to the average treatment effect. So maybe I'm going to push forward and this is my uh, estimate I'm going for. Now, that's a decision. And then once you make that decision, the statistical estimation problem is now defined. You have to find the data. It has a probability distribution. You told me what you know about your probability distribution, like certain uh, conditions, like the treatments is completely random, for example, or it depends only on a few covariates. 
and you know what the statistical estimate is. What is what are you trying to learn from the data? Now that's phenomenal. That's a phenomenal step. That's that's a very powerful part of the roadmap, uh, allowing you to be very concrete. What are we doing here? What are we trying to learn? We could even do simulations, investigating if people come up with a candidate estimator to what degree they're actually succeeding in solving this problem. So everything can be benchmarked now. Either way, since the Cisco estimation problem is now well-defined, then the next question becomes, how are we going to estimate it? And that's step four, that's construct an estimator. Now, if you just look at this estimate, you can already see to get to this, you need the probability of death as a function of the treatment and the covariance. So that's the main thing. And then you need to take an average over the population distribution of the covariates, but that's easy to do. That's just an empirical mean. So really, the only thing you have to learn from the data is the probability of death as a function of the treatment and the covariates. Uh, so that's one thing you see right away. These are the stochastic relations that, of the data distribution. You have to learn from the data somehow to get to this uh, estimate. So, OK, so we have a sense what it's going to take. Uh, but how are we going to construct a good estimator? Now, there are a bunch of properties you might not want to consider. For example, it would be nice if we have a substitution estimator, meaning it's of the type I just described. You say, let's estimate from the data the probability of death as a function of the treatment and the covariate, evaluate it for a given W subject under treatment and control, take the difference, take the empirical mean. That's a plug-in estimator. That has the benefit, for example, if y is a binary variable like here, uh, that it's guaranteed to be in probability. It doesn't go out of bounds. It respects the bounds on both the statistical model you have imposed as well, the bounds naturally implied by the target estimate, uh, like a difference in probabilities. Right? So, and so, uh, and that's not true for every estimator. Many estimators which go another route, which don't do the plugin approach, they might end up under positivity with negative estimates of probability or bigger than one. All these things can happen. And it's more than that. It's not just that that can happen, which is more than annoying. It also shows there's some inefficiency in these estimates and finite samples because it ignores knowledge, important global bounds. And that's bad. And that's particularly bad for if the sample is, you know, borderline allowing you to get to your answer. You want to utilize the sample fully. And that's precisely where then the benefit comes from these plug-in estimators. And also don't forget, maximum likelihood estimators and paramedic models would be plug-in estimators, right? You would estimate your density of the data, and that may be, in this case, only parameterized by a finite dimensional vector like a beta. And then once you have that, you can calculate any feature of that, any function of beta. And so you, you would also do a plug-in estimator. That's what maximum likelihood is. So this is just saying, let's stick to that. That's one of the things why we like maximum likelihood estimators. They are plug-in, they are robust in that way. So we don't want to give up on that. Uh, the other thing, uh, you want your estimator to be able to provide confidence intervals, which actually do have approximately 95% coverage and do have a type one error of approximately 0.05. So how are we going to do that? That's a property we can maybe all agree on. Okay, that's a serious one. Because that means right away we can forget the paramedic plugin estimators, even though they're plugin, they're going to be biased and they won't provide valid inference. We already discussed that. So we need to do something like machine learning. Okay. And then do it in a way that still provides inference, meaning the estimator needs to have a sampling distribution and we need to be able to approximate it, estimate it from the data, like an approximately normal limit distribution or, or the bootstrap should work. So these are serious questions and we want that. These are serious properties we need. And then on top of that, you say, look, uh, I want an estimator, which is not just acting as a behaving, what we call as an empirical mean, right? The estimator minus truth behaves like an empirical mean of a so-called transformation of the unit specific data structure. It's also called the influence curve, which then allows you to do normal sampling distribution approximations and thereby get confidence intervals like wall type confidence intervals and all that uh, but and that's kind of what you need for the valid inference we call it also asymptotic linearity the estimator needs to be asymptotic linear right? it's almost like an empirical mean but uh, so the second order term which deviates from the empirical mean is some is has to be negligible but then the other one is i want minimal variance i want 
my estimator minus proof to behave like an empirical mean of a so-called efficient Immelz curve, meaning it's fully efficient. That is asymptotically, it cannot be beaten by any other estimator. Now that's called efficiency. There's a whole theory, statistical theory for that. And it tells us what it takes for an estimator to be asymptotically efficient. And that's defined by the so-called canonical gradient of the target estimate. So it's some derivative, just like a gradient of a function. You have to compute from the target estimate and that gives you the canonical gradient. And that's also called the efficient Immelz curve. And if an estimator, minus truth behaves like an empirical mean of the efficient Immelz curve, you got it, you're asymptotically efficient. So that's another thing which is important. And then you want some enormous flexibility of this procedure. You wanna be able to handle all the challenges which happen in finite samples, like very high dimensional covariates, uh, for example, or small sample size, or covariates, which are extreme confounders. They're very predictive of the treatment, but maybe not even necessarily of the outcome, like almost instrument or instrumental variables, which can really kill you for many of these procedures. How do you get a methodology which has the flexibility to deal with any of these finite sample challenges and allow you then to tailor the procedure towards your setting where all these things happen and be able to respond to that if they uh, occur in the data? Now that's uh, another big one. And, uh, and there's uh, all kinds of variations of, of uh, we could talk about, about all these features you wanna add to your estimator, which adds that finite sample robustness and the whole target learning literature has a lot of them. Uh, even more recently, the so-called high order team elite keep adding these kind of yeah, powerful features, which make it better and better in finite samples and responding to these real challenging situations. Okay, so when you care about these statistical properties, uh, then you essentially will be doing TMLE. Uh, you have to be a plug-in estimator, you have agreed on that. You need to use machine learning, you have agreed on that. You need to be having inference, you will have to do the targeting. So there is no way out. You will be doing TMLE if you can agree on these statistical properties. Now, TMLE is a two-step procedure. The first step is construct an initial estimator of that probability of death as a function of the treatment and the covariates. And that's where we often recommend super learning because that allows you to utilize all the powerful algorithms in, in the machine learning literature and create one algorithm which is better than all its parts and is thereby able to adapt uh, to what, to essentially choose the algorithm which is best for your particular application but does it all in an a priori specified data adaptive way. And then it's actually supported by the theory of super learning, which tells you that that's actually the right thing to do, that it's actually having the ability to indeed do as well as the best possible choice for your data, even though you didn't know a priori what it was. We call it asymptotic equivalence with the Oracle selector. And then comes the second step. And that's the bridge, if you want, from machine learning, which is the super learning now, to statistical inference. And that was a bridge which was lacking. There were two worlds. There was the machine learning world and there was the traditional statistics world. This is the bridge which allows you to still do the machine learning and still have formal theory providing inference without these uh, yeah, unreasonable assumptions like parametric models. And, and, and a targeting step in essence is a step which says, you know, I'm going to take, I'm going to improve my fit in a very specific direction of that stochastic relation of death as a function of the treatment and the covariate, so that it becomes a great fit for the estimate, in other words, where it's going to be plugged in, and, and really giving the best bias variance trade-off, and, and thereby, in particular, removing significant bias, which would normally kill you for inference, and but puts it at a level that it becomes negligible at minimal asymptotically. Now, TMLE, there's a lot of theory for them, but they have all these properties. They are asymptotically efficient. They're asymptotically linear. They behave like an empirical mean. They're plug-in estimators. As I said, they're efficient and uh, asymptotically unbiased for sure. And then it has all these options for making them fine and simple robust. Um, now, in particular, of course, the super learning gives that incredible power that you don't have to bet on one algorithm, that you can kind of just have to create a range of algorithms so that your Super learning will choose the kind, right algorithm for your application. Now, that's an incredible way of adding that finite sample robustness on that perspective. Uh, but there are other ones, uh, uh, such as uh, collaborative TMLE dealing with uh, 
confounders, uh, like putting targeting the treatment mechanism fits the propensity score towards its goal instead of just for the sake of fitting the propensity score. Uh, and then there is, as I said, there are several others, and, and there's cross-validated team lead to deal with potential overfits of the initial estimate to make the targeting step more robust, there, uh, and so on and so on. And then even nowadays, we have high-order team lead as a more recent advance. So all these things are about adding flexibility to your, to if you want to add more and more properties to your procedure to deal with your specific challenge you, have, you might have to deal with. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these two steps. Now, the super learner is probably well known by now uh, for many of you. Uh, but anyway, to keep it short, there you will have to specify a library of machine learning algorithms. So here's an example with Bayesian regression tree, random forest, linear regression, GLM nets, probably regression splines, neural networks if you want, and highly adaptive loss. So, which is a very powerful machine learning algorithm. We had a whole talk on it. So it's something to keep in mind. It has incredible theoretical properties, uh, convergence at a rate n to the minus one third up to log n factors and so on. So that's a very powerful guy. Uh, you kind of might want to include in your library as well. Then uh, it just holds an internal competition. So it splits the data in nine tenths, let's say one tenth. Nine tenth is called training sample. The other one tenth is called the validation sample. You train all these algorithms on nine tenths and you evaluate how well they do on the left out patients or the data points. And that's uh, for that you need a loss, right? And if you do regression, it might be a squared error loss function or a log likelihood of this binary. It might be a log likelihood or error under curve. There are all these choices, but either way, it needs to be uh, so that if you optimize that loss, you're actually trying to, you will actually get close and close to the true desired function you're trying to learn, like in conditional probability. And of course, you don't do a single split cross stage, you do it tenfold so that you're utilizing the full data because why choose only one training sample? Why not go through many of these training samples? And the most effective and computer sensible way is then default cross validation. And so now you can have a performance assessment for each of the candidate estimators in your library uh, and an honest one. And now, even when maybe one algorithm was incredibly aggressive and data adaptive and the other algorithm was linear regression, it doesn't matter. This is a valid criteria. So you, if, if linear regression wins from let's say random forest, then random linear regression is the right algorithm and does just a better job. And so, uh, and that's what can happen. And certainly depending on sample size, all these things can happen. And you don't know a priori what is going to happen. And that's precisely the power of superlearner that it will just figure it out for you. And so in particular, if you use the convex superlearner where you go for the best weighted combination of the algorithms instead of the discrete superlearner, which just choose the best algorithm, uh, then it might say, you know, one third BART, a uh, little bit uh, GLM, and, uh, and the rest uh, highly adaptive loss. So, and it becomes then a weighted combination of a few algorithms. But there's much more to say about uh, super learner because it's all about the meta learning step, and, and you could do more aggressive things than just uh, convex, and, and there's work on that. And, and, uh, but I'm not going to get deeper into that. The other thing to keep in mind is that this whole super learner gives so much flexibility that you can. Uh, for example, built in algorithms which couple dimension reduction methods towards uh, particular machine learning algorithms, which will generally improve things. Uh, and that's particular powerful in these things where you have in these problems where you have very high dimensional covariate profiles, like in genomics, but also in this natural language processing where we create all these features of how many times a word occurs and so on and so on. You have many, many of them, and uh, you want you don't want to throw all these guys to one algorithm you just want to first do some sensible dimension reduction before and then throw it at it and and then how far you push the dimension reduction is then just another tuning parameter giving another algorithm in your library and at the end the cross relation will figure out what the right way to do is so you don't have to worry about one bet one way to do it you can throw in many stretches as long as they are uh, and there's no price to pay because the more diversity the more chance that you have a good strategy in there, and that's the one the super learner will like. Uh, then, after you have done uh, the super learner, in this case, for fitting the probability of death as a function of the treatment and the covariance, uh, then we need to do this uh, team lead update step. So we're not just immediately going to say, oh, now I have my probability of death uh, for every subject under treatment and control, I take the difference and take the average over the sample. That will be the regular plug and estimator based on super learner, but that is not yet having the theoretical properties we want. It's not asymptotically linear, so it won't provide you with inference. And it won't be, it will be just too biased. 
because of the fact that it was going for the whole function. It didn't think about that the only thing it cares about is this particular feature of the function, which is this average limit effect. Now that's where TMLE comes in. And what's the idea of TMLE? It says, you know, let's do a little extra fitting of this initial estimate of the outcome of regression. This probability of death is a function of the treatment of covariates. Why don't we just add a covariate and let and put it in the coefficient to let's call it epsilon. So now fit epsilon and then you get an update of that outcome regression. But what covariate should we add? And that covariate could be a function of A and W, treatment and the covariate. What covariate should we add to get the maximal benefit, not for the function, because you know, sure, it will improve a little bit, but for the actual target estimate so that the fit gets better. And so what it does, it looks for that clever covariate, that function, so that if we now fit the epsilon, the coefficient, you know, like by increasing, by fitting, maximizing the likelihood, let's say, then as you increase the likelihood from epsilon to zero, to no increase, and then you start moving in the direction of the maximum, you see the increase of likelihood on the x-axis. And what you want to look for is that the, that the change for every increase in likelihood the change in the estimate is maximal. You want to see the estimate moving for a small change in the likelihood. So if you have a little increase in the likelihood, you want to get maximal change in the estimate. And so it's all about the slope, the slope you see in this picture, where you see that as we move from epsilon zero towards the MLE for epsilon, right, where the, where the, in this paramedic model, where the offset is the super learner and you have this clever covariate, the clever covariate is chosen so that as I move epsilon, every unit increase in likelihood, I get a maximal change <clears throat> in the estimate. In other words, I'm moving maximally fast towards the estimate, the true value. And that's what you see here. If you have, for example, two types of updates, one uses the actual TMLE update and something else uses some other covariate, you start seeing that the TMLE one goes very steep. It goes actually maximally steep among all possible choices. So it translates any extra fitting maximally into removing bias from the estimate actually and it does it in a finite sample way this is not just an asymptotic thing this is actually happening in a finite sample and so that's uh, why the team is so fundamental and so crucial to link this machine learning state-of-the-art machine learning towards actual plug-in estimation of target features with corresponding inference so then we end up at the next step uh, which is we want to obtain inference. Now, in TMLE gives you the benefit that it will be an asymptotic linear estimator, meaning TMLE minus its target estimate behaves like an empirical mean of the so-called efficient impulse function. Efficient impulse curve It's also called, and it's actually equal to the canonical gradient of the pathwise derivative of the target estimate. So there's some mathematical exercise you have to do once you know your statistical model and your target estimate. You can co calculate the so-called pathwise derivative of the target estimate and figure out the canonical gradient, and that will be the efficient impulse curve. And now you're looking for an, for an estimator, so that estimator minus the, its target estimate behaves like the empirical mean of the efficient impulse curve, that, in order to the canonical gradient. And then you can prove that it's an asymptotically efficient estimator among the class of all regular estimators. So, but that also means, firstly, we need that that efficient impulse function is already used in the team lead. That's how it figures out how to do the targeting step. So the efficient impulse curve implies the targeting step. So you already have it in your hands when you do TMLE. And you now also know that TMLE minus true behaves like the empirical mean of that object. And therefore, you can do inference as if you're doing inference for a sample mean. So in other words, you, the efficient impulse curve, you have it for every subject. You calculate the sample variance. And your variance of your estimator is estimated as the sample variance of the influence curve divided by n. And then you can construct wall type confidence intervals and so on. Now, that allows you now to construct confidence intervals for free. Uh, and then there are also advances where we use bootstrap uh, to pick up more second order terms to make the inference a lot more robust in finite samples. In particular, if you utilize highly adaptive lasso, we have uh, papers on showing that you can actually do that and it's theoretically valid and it will behave better in finite samples uh, when these second order remainders are a real issue. Now, uh, so you can now do the whole analysis. You have your uh, and you then, in this case, we find a TMLE with a somewhat shifted estimate to, away from the null and actually now a confidence interval due to the gain in efficiency, uh, which actually excludes one and thereby you have a significant uh, result. 
So then comes the sixth step, which is, okay, so we did a lot of hard work. We formulated a statistical estimation problem. We had, with that, a target estimate. We knew it was trying to get towards some so-called causal quantity, like an average human effect. But there might have been a difference there. And so can I, so what my confidence interval was about a confidence interval for the estimate. So that's nice. That's a 95% confidence interval for the estimate. But what does that tell us about the actual average treatment effects, for example? Now, if the if you know the average treatment effect equals our estimate because you, you know the assumptions of no emission confounding are true, now then you're done. You can then not only claim a confidence interval for the estimate, which can be interpreted statistically, but you can then also claim it's also a confidence interval for the causal effect, the average causal treatment effect. Okay, so here's just an example of two studies. In this study, we have, let's say, an observational study, but we know how the doctors assigned the treatment. And we know it was only in response to a few covariates. And, and so it's kind of a beautiful observational study where the so-called randomization assumption holds. And, and let's say the, there's actual experimentation. The doctors were experimenting, so it's not like they all were always throwing that treatment uh, when cer for certain types of subjects. And so uh, we have now a situation where this true causal effect, which is here, this dotted line, and the estimate, which is defined psi one stat, are right on top of each other. Now, that means your confidence interval, here's the estimator, the TMLE, here's the confidence interval, will now also be a confidence interval for that guy. So you, you're fine. You can interpret your confidence interval for, as a confidence interval for the average treatment effect, uh, or in more generally, for your causal effect you defined, you were interested in. And here's another study where things were not so nice. I right? just think about maybe uh, electronic uh, health records and, you, and there was uh, concern about not measuring the right things and, and didn't include natural language processes to get maybe some key confounders. And so we have a real gap. We have a gap between the estimates and, and the estimates is here. That's the Psi2 stat. And here is the causal quantity. That's the causal gap. That's not something you could, it has to do with the data. It has to do with your identification assumptions. You decided to go for this guy, but you know you were aware that there might have been an issue here. That this and that might there might actually be a difference between the estimate and the causal quality. Anyway, you got a confidence interval, and it was a confidence interval for your estimates. But now you cannot just say that's also a confidence interval for the causal quantity. So that's where we get into what we uh, we need to think about this. We need to make a picture like this and say, you know, here's where we are. What do we think about that causal gap? How big do we think it might be? And that's precisely the kind of non parametric sensitive analysis we have proposed in the past and, and, and we generally uh, use these days. It's a relatively simple one, but very helpful and very transparent. And so here's an, an essential, uh, yeah, what you do, you say for every level of causal gap, you can just shift the confidence interval or shift the p-value towards uh, what it would have been if you know the causal gap, right? Then you can map the confidence interval for the estimate into a confidence interval for the causal quantity. It will be shifting it. So you can just see how the confidence interval moves and you can see, hey, wow, this confidence interval very quickly gets out, suddenly, you know, makes the result non-significant, even though, you know, if for the estimate it was significant. So that makes you very worried. And then you have to kind of think about how big is that gap? Is that something I expect to be true? And then in another study, which maybe was a lousy observational study, but the, but to, the, the result was so strong for the estimate, so significant, that you need so much causal gap in order to wash it away, that you still say, this has to be real, right? And we show an example in our paper with uh, Ivan Diaz and myself, on, on, which is actually a real world example of that type. Okay, so here's an, an example of a uh, sensitivity analysis carried out by Susan, uh, also presented in a webinar. And so here it's for a uh, study where you have 25% loss to follow up, uh, maybe some randomized trial. And it reported a confidence interval for the, let's say, average treatment effect. And uh, you see here um, the targeted estimate is this guy here. This is no effect, so it was actually a big effect. And the confidence interval was still excluding uh, no effect. So everything looks pretty clear. But nonetheless, you can say, look, uh, suppose, let me investigate how would my uh, TMLE, which was adjusting for all the measured covariates, 
if I would not have adjusted for any covariates, but just use an unadjusted, how different would the TMLE be from that simple unadjusted association? Let's say it's 0.68 in her example. So let's, maybe we're willing to assume that the confounders we might have missed should, you know, should not exceed that kind, should be comparable with the confounders we actually measured. And we know what the impact of them was, namely this 0.68. So you could then make a picture like this, where you just put here, uh, if you move a half times this, this amount or one times this amount in this direction, and you see the confidence of all moving up. And so this is now a confidence of all for the causal effect under the assumption that this causal gap is this size. And then here that it's free, the causal gap is three and a half times 0.68. And so you see then to wash away the effect from a real strong effect to no effect, a confidence law which includes uh, no effect, you need to move five times almost uh, times this difference you saw between your TMLE and a completely simple unadjusted difference in mean. So you might then say, wow, I'm pretty darn confident that we are in a safe zone. Either way, it's up for interpretation. It's up for discussion. That's completely not something we, as statisticians, necessarily have to dive into. That's uh, but we can help. And that's what this tries to do: to give you some insight where the data can help to give some insight what these leaving out confounders could do. But there might be more subject matter information as well, and that should be incorporated in this discussion as well. So here's another one where we say uh, this is a safety analysis example where at the assumption of no causal gap, we are having a estimate of a relative risk using TMLE, which gave us a 1.08 estimate. Now, that's not very impressive, right, as estimate. And it gave a confidence interval, which includes one. So the TMLE says there is no significant result. Now, in safety analysis, it's a little funny, right? You're just, all you're saying, it's, yeah, we don't have evidence that it's really different uh, that this, there is a safety signal, but you know, maybe it's due to unmeasured confounding. Maybe if I would have adjusted for confounding, I would have seen a bigger signal and would have a safety issue. For example, there's a treatment arm, which is your drug you're worried about, and there's a control arm. And suppose, what's quite common, since the control arm is kind of a drug which has been used on the market for quite some time, that drug is generally given to sicker people just because doctors want to be more safe for them. So now you have action confounding going on. If you don't adjust properly for this, it would look as if there's no safety signal when in fact there might be. So that's where again, the sensitiveness doesn't stop by saying, oh, I didn't find anything. No, we're still going. We are saying, look, if I assume, uh, I, again, you can still play the game of if you leave out all the covariates, how much would the team leave? And you can also just do it for one covert, of course. But if you leave out uh, all the covariates, how much adjustment did the TMLE and the super learner do? It was 0.87. Uh, what happens if I move one, if I assume a causal gap, which is similar to that, right? Then I move this confidence interval uh, towards this, or here it is. Okay. And then if I do that another time, I'm here, and now I'm getting to a confidence interval, which now excludes one, and therefore suggests a safety signal. So again, you may then have to talk about that. Is that something I find reasonable? There might be the unmatched confounding. You might be able to argue that's really going on. Do you also think it could be that much? No. You might say yes. And again, of course, you can do simulations as well, and you can do all kinds of stuff. But that's this is now an important stage at the, when the data analysis has been done, the confidence intervals, the, 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 the p values, whatever they all have been reported for the estimates. But now we still do this extra step of sensitive analysis to really acknowledge that we cannot go to the causal effect conclusion except if we are honest about what we assume about the causal gap. So let's just present the results for every level of the causal gap and then talk about what we think is reasonable uh, bound on that causal gap. And then you can see if you really are firm in your conclusion uh, or not. And that's all fine. Target learning is not trying to get you answers which are false. It's trying to get a completely honest presentation of all the difficulties, all the complexities in your study. And it's not trying to cut corners anywhere. That's the whole point. So that's um, like if we go back to the data example, 
uh, you might also have, of course, additional questions. You might say, look, uh, it was nice to have an average human effect, but what about, is, are there subgroups of interest? Uh, and in this study, there happens to be an incredible subgroup. It's a very simple one. They did a stress test. Of, and if you responded to the stress test, uh, the relative risk was uh, smaller than one. And if you were non-responding to the stress test, the relative risk was bigger than one. Uh, so steroids helped here, but didn't help there. And so that's, uh, of course, incredibly important to know. And that was one of the reasons why they had such a hard time to showing anything across all these randomized trials, because there was this kind of two groups always present, and one that's bad and one that's good. And that's, again, something, of course, you're, you don't have to focus on one question. You can look at many questions, of course, and you might have other a priori questions about different subgroups. There's actually other things we can do, and that's what we do in the so-called literature on optimal dynamic treatments. It's just figuring from the data with an a priori specified algorithm to figure out what is the subgroup which should be treated and for which there's a benefit. And that corresponds with, if you give them the treatment, that's the same as applying the optimal individualized treatment rule. And you can do that with an a priori specified algorithm which tries to learn that subgroup as good as possible and then act as if that is the rule you're going to use and then get formal inference for that through so-called cross-validated team only. And, and so we call that data adaptive target parameters, or, or, but either way, uh, it allows you to avoid the whole multiple testing and looking at many, many subgroups but by still just having one confidence of all for one question, except it's a data adaptive question. Uh, so that's another interesting area. Uh, but either way, that's what this uh, data showed. Okay, so to conclude, uh, regarding target learning with real-world data, we started out by, uh, you know, presenting this kind of continuum of studies going from very clean RCTs to more and more messy uh, observational data with more and more complexities. And all these complexities we discussed, the intercurrent events, informative missingness of the outcome, let's say, treatment, confounding, high-dimensional covariates, maybe outcome measurements, ascertainment, error, uh, statistical model misspecification, and so on. And targeted learning deals with these challenges by going through these steps, right? The roadmap for causal statistical inference allows us to be honest about the statistical model, thereby not getting the mistake of statistical model misspecification. It goes through the causal language, causal models to define the causal quantity you truly care about, getting the identification result for, and thereby coming up with a statistical estimate which answers that causal question under assumptions. So that estimate will, you know, it could be like a so-called longitudinal G computation formula, which takes into account intercurrent events, takes into account informative missing outcomes, takes into account confounding. All that is taken into account in that estimate. That's why that estimate is not a simple thing. It's not necessarily a simple regression coefficient. It's not. It, it's uh, if you start getting in truly longitudinal data with intercurrent events, you get the so-called longitudinal G computation formula. So you have to learn the likelihood if ordered over time and learn all these conditional densities and then target them and, and so on and so on. And uh, allowing you to answer complex causal uh, questions such as what would the death rate have been if we would have applied the following dynamic treatment rule for all patients at multiple time points. These are the questions uh, are then defined by an estimate. That deals with all these challenges, intercurrent events and so on, and the missing is and all that. Now, the statistical estimate approximates the answer to a causal question. We're honest about it. We say, it. we don't say it's necessarily true. That's what the causal gap is about. We have a whole step for that. It's the sensitivity analysis. We are just, that's open. That's for us to discuss. That's about where we get it, why we need to know so much about our study. We need to understand our study to get towards that understanding of these causal assumptions to what degree they might be violated. We deal with out statistical model misspecification through the super learner. We deal with high dimensional covariates again through the super learner because we can do effective dimension reduction without betting on one strategy. Just let you throw them all in. Uh, we, and then, yeah, we deal with these challenges of violations of uh, these identification assumptions through the sensitivity analysis. And so at the end of the day, it's about coming up with a transparent approach which provides transparent conclusions, which have clear interpretation 
and also acknowledges the uncertainty in the, the randomness of the data. That's where the confidence interval around the estimate happens. And the uncertainty regarding to what degree the estimate approximates the true causal quality. And that's where the sensitive analysis then has another uncertainty potentially kick in. And that's the whole story. So finally, uh, yeah, target learning is an evolving field. It's, it's, it's incredible flexible. It deals with any estimation problem. So we are applying it to sequential adaptive. And when I say applying, that doesn't mean it's just like, oh, it's just like this. No, no, you go through the roadmap for that particular type of experiment. And you go through all the steps and you develop the super and you develop the team elite you and all that is all done. So every time it's a whole effort, but either way, a lot we has been done. And like, for example, sequential adaptive randomized trials. We are now also involving in that work, uh, surrogate outcomes so that we can respond to, uh, yeah, if, even when maybe the outcome takes a long time, you already have surrogate outcomes. So you can start responding earlier so that these adaptive trials become also more doable uh, when the clinical outcomes take some time. Uh, we, we work on online learning for wearable devices and so on. Uh, online super learning has been developed and software and all that. Uh, we have worked on causal inference for networks where you observe uh, yeah, multiple individuals and at any point in time. The variables generated by that individual are a function of its own past, but also the past of its friends. You might have knowledge about that type of network. And then uh, causal effects of uh, yeah, site-specific uh, RCTs. I guess this gets maybe to more cluster randomized trials and that kind of thing, uh, but either way. Uh, and yeah, learning from electronic health record data for better confounder control, all that is uh, are all important things. So I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate you taking the time to um, sort of summarize and wrap things up for us and, and show how targeted learning can be used in a whole, to address a whole variety of questions and a whole variety of studies. Um, we do have time for maybe one question if, if anybody wants to type it into yeah, the I've, chat I've, or the q and I have time beyond that. So. Yeah, but most other people have, yeah, to, um, <laughs> have to go on. But we do have a question. Yeah. While we're waiting, I'll, I'll ask a question to fill in the gap. And, and my question is, suppose someone has done a study and they haven't used TMLE and they haven't used um, super learning you know maybe they did some matching is there a way to sort of evaluate the quality of the evidence from that kind of a study or if you haven't started at the beginning are you just are you just out of luck oh yeah you can kind of retroactively you can still go through the roadmap right and that will then give you a lot of information and then you will find out how appropriate this methodology was uh, for this particular problem and if it took into account all the complexities. Uh, so yeah, you kind of have to still go through the roadmap to even understand if somebody, what somebody did is the right thing to do. And that's why the roadmap is also so helpful. It gives you this compass that if people do work, you can judge it. You can say, you can ask the person these questions. What was your data gen experiment? Tell me what you know about it. What did you actually assume? Did you assume more than what you know? Why did you do that? Are you not worried? But uh, the statistical inference going down the drain. Uh, what was the question? Was that really the question, or is that just your coefficient in your model? You spit it out. Right? All these key questions you can now ask, and then you will quickly find out. Okay, well, was he even addressing the problem we cared about? If he does, then you can still worry about statistical properties of the estimator. Is it truly asymptotically linear? Does it utilize super learning? Does it utilize, uh, let's say? Uh, yeah, targeting to make the estimate as linear, right? There are all these problems with inverse probability treatment, weighted estimators, and, and propensity score matching. That if you just use, let's say, super learner or machine learning, you're you're not going to be asymptotically linear. And neither, if of course, certainly not if you're a parametric model, you're not even consistent. So these are statistical questions, but at least they try to answer the question of interest, right? So somebody who goes through the roadmap defines the plugin estimate and then uses a parametric model for fitting these stochastic relations and plugs them in, I mean, that's, that he's on his way, or she or he is on his way. I mean, he's doing, 
that he, he went through the whole formulation. He defined the rest, the, the right estimate. And then he used still plug-in estimation with parametric models. It's not bad. That allows you, and then yeah, of course, then we would say, you know, let's improve this a little, right? Why bet on one parametric model? Were you not sure about that one? Why not have 10 parametric models? Why not do a little crossway to choose the best one? Now, by then he's doing super learn. And then you say, you know, why don't you add a clever go? With it? And then he's doing team elite, right? So it is really about the whole formulation, which gets people on board because from then on, it's like, you're going to do this. And how you precisely do it, again, there are all these possibilities, right? We don't have to do the most aggressive super learner. We can just do a library with a bunch of parametric models, or you can do whatever you want. But at the end, you need to understand what the implications are. Okay, thank you very much. So now we have come to the end. We're out of time. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And again, thank you, Mark, for um, sharing all this with us. Great. Thanks so much.